So there's been this growing concern over the last few years that many of the uh, studies that we see in the published scientific literature are not correct, not robust, not replicable. And the evidence ranges from disciplines as broad uh, or as diverse as psychology and cancer biology. And interestingly, one of the early sectors to identify a potential problem was the pharmaceutical industry, which argued that many of the findings that it took from the published academic literature into its own discovery uh, pipelines couldn't be uh, reproduced. So they reached the conclusion that the academic literature simply wasn't robust enough to support their drug discovery pipelines. And in other fields, a broadly similar conclusion has been reached, which is that only about 40% of the published scientific literature is robust. So here are the um, results of one of the empirical attempts to estimate what proportion of published research findings are correct, which is the reproducibility project psychology. On the left-hand side, you can see p-values, and on the right-hand side, effect sizes for 100 uh, psychology studies that had been published in three high-profile psychology journals. And in this project, they took those uh, studies and attempted to replicate them as closely as possible, often working with the original study authors to agree on the study protocols and to share materials and so on. And if you look on the left-hand side of the p-values, you can see those for the original studies and those for the replication studies. In the original studies, nearly all of the p-values were less than 0.05, because that's basically how you publish something in psychology. Whereas in the replication studies, they ranged from essentially 0 to 1. And perhaps more interestingly, when you look at the effect sizes on the right-hand side, for the replication studies, effect sizes were systematically smaller than in the original studies, and in many cases were reversed, reaching the opposite conclusion, if you like. So again, this um, project estimated that about 40% of these 100 uh, psychology studies um, could be uh, replicated. And what was more interesting, perhaps, though, was that in parallel to this, there was a prediction market running. Now, prediction markets are used by economists to capture what is globally known as the wisdom of crowds. The idea that knowledge can be held, often privately, by a community of individuals, and prediction markets are meant to be a means by which that knowledge can be extracted. So here, a subset of 20 of those um, studies that were being replicated in this project were offered in a prediction market. And participants were given real money that they could use to buy and sell positions on those 20 individual hypotheses. And the idea was that if you thought that the market had overpriced the likelihood of a study replicating, you would sell that position. And if you thought it had underpriced the probability of a study replicating, you would buy that position. And the market um, moved dynamically over a couple of weeks, very much like a stock market where people are buying and selling stocks and shares. And at the end of that process, the market was frozen and used to predict the eventual outcome of the replication studies. So what the graph shows is in grey, the 50% um, market price. Above that, the market would have predicted that the study would successfully replicate, and below that, the market would have predicted that the study would fail to replicate. Black squares show studies that did in fact replicate, and red squares show studies that did in fact not replicate. So the market did a pretty good job. Above the line, the squares were enriched for black, and below the line, the squares were enriched for red. So what can explain the fact that for these studies, which were all published, in most cases had p-values less than 0.05, all appeared in high-quality psychology journals, what could explain the fact that the community knew with a reasonably high degree of accuracy which of the studies actually had conclusions that were robust and which didn't? The problem is, that in science at the moment, we have no means of communicating effectively this hidden knowledge. And this taps into my own experience as an early career researcher, where I set up the first study of my PhD, hoping to replicate a finding that the published literature would have me believe was absolutely robust. I was unable to do so, and the problem was that if I had relied on my own experience, I would, let, I would have come to the conclusion that there must be something that I had done that meant that my study didn't replicate, that I was a poor scientist. And it was only because I was fortunate enough to bump into a grizzled old academic at a conference who said, oh, everyone knows that that finding is rubbish, no one can replicate that, that I was able to correct that. So we don't publish our null results, we don't publish our failures to replicate, largely because we're not rewarded for doing so. The current incentives prioritize novelty, groundbreaking research, finding something new, and publishing that kind of finding in certain kinds of journals. And of course, while that's important, it's certainly not all that we need to do as scientists if science is going to progress and going to be self-correct. 
So one of the problems here is that although we're trained as scientists to be impartial and objective, the reality is that we're still human and humans are subject to a range of cognitive biases which psychologists know something about. And this quote from Nicholas Taleb, who's not a psychologist but was a trader on the US markets, illustrates that point quite nicely. Scientists may be in the business of laughing at their predecessors owing to an array of human mental dispositions. Few realize that someone will laugh at their beliefs in the disappointingly near future. So what are these mental dispositions, these cognitive biases that could lead us astray? Here's an example of a photograph taken by an orbiting satellite of a geological feature on the surface of Mars. The first one was taken in the 1970s and it looks like a face. And some people, not many people, took that as evidence of intelligent extraterrestrial life. The problem is that that same feature when photographed later in 1998 and 2001 looked completely different. The original photograph was a trick of the light, amplified, if you like, by the tendency that humans have to see faces in objects. We see faces on the surface of Mars, we see uh, the face of Jesus in pieces of toast. There's a natural bias towards seeing faces in objects and more generally for seeing patterns in noise. And that can lead us astray, especially when we're looking for certain things. So if we can't replicate a geological feature on the surface of Mars, what hope is there for those of us that are dealing with much more complex, noisy biological data sets where we have a specific hypothesis and can therefore be fooled into thinking that the data support our hypothesis when perhaps in fact they don't? How can we protect ourselves against those biases? And is the current scientific system well set up to do that? This is a survey from a few years ago, and I think this quote nicely captures part of the problem. Certain features of the working environment of science may have unexpected and potentially detrimental effects on the ethical dimensions of scientists' work. Nearly all scientists go into science because they're enthusiastic about their subject, because they're keen to find something new, because they want to discover something exciting about the world. And of course, that's fantastic, but it's also part of the problem because that enthusiasm and that excitement means that we can be led astray when we find or think we found what we were looking for. It can lead us to confirmation biases where we uh, err on the side of an interpretation that aligns with our expectations. And no amount of training can fully protect us against that, however much we try to be impartial and objective scientists. We're all excited and enthusiastic about our own topic. This is a nice cartoon from the blogger Neuroskeptic, borrowing from Dante, illustrating that on the one hand, you do have cases of fraudulent behavior, falsification down here in, um, in the icy jaws of, uh, of Satan in this cartoon. And at the other end of the scale, you have the um, completely disinterested, impartial, objective scientist. And very few people fall into either of those categories. Most of us fall into the middle somewhere in this gray area where we engage in behaviors that are not fraudulent, but not ideal and potentially problematic, where we oversell our results or our conclusions, where we um, retrofit our hypotheses after having seen the data, where we interrogate our data perhaps a little bit more enthusiastically than we should do, or exclude certain outlying data points to uh, present a cleaner narrative, if you like. All of these things are problematic, but in many cases, they have become so mainstream and so normative that people forget that they're problematic. So in a, um, an example from my own experience as a journal editor, we once offered to authors a major revision, and one of the reviewers had said, I'm surprised you hypothesized X, I thought you would have hypothesized Y. And the reviewer was simply asking for more explanation of why the authors had set up their hypothesis in a particular way, but in response, the authors said in their response letter, thank you for your comments. In response, we've changed our hypotheses. So they were changing their hypotheses after the study uh, to fit with the results that they had um, obtained and to make publication easier. And the point is not so much that they said that, but that they thought it was okay to say that because it's so commonplace, because people uh, routinely claim to have found what they were looking for, or rather claim that what they found was what they were looking for in the first place. It even has a name, harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. And of course, there's nothing wrong with exploratory research, but by presenting exploratory research where we generate a hypothesis from our data, 
as confirmatory research, where we had the hypothesis first and then tested that hypothesis within our data, we give a very distorted impression of what we've actually done. And in psychology, over 90% of published papers claim to have found what they were looking for in the first place, which certainly doesn't map onto my personal experience. I couldn't claim that 90% of the studies that I've done have worked out the way that I'd hoped or anticipated. And yet, if I were to read the published literature, that would be what I felt other people were experiencing. So one of the problems is this extent to which we're encouraged to explore our data and then present what we've done as confirmatory. So this is a nice illustration of what has been described as the garden of forking paths problem by Andrew Gelman and others, the idea that we start with our data and we route through it looking for interesting findings, uh, potentially with a broad hypothesis in mind. Uh, but really what we're doing for uh, what we're doing is looking for a p-value less than 0.05. And then what we do, having found it, is trace a line back to the data and say, well, we did this. So in our published paper, we say, um, we started with our data and we ran this analytical pipeline and we reached this p-value less than 0.05. And what we don't say is how many times we had to roll the dice, so to speak, to get to that 0.6. And so we're presenting a very um, biased perspective on just how many analyses that we ran. And therefore, the p-value that we're claiming can't be interpreted, at least not in the way that we would conventionally interpret it, because you need to take into account the number of tests that you run to be able to do that. So here's an example of how that flexibility in the design and the conduct and the analysis of a study can lead to conclusions that are clearly false. These are results based on real data in an experimental design where participants were randomized to listen to When I'm 64 by the Beatles or another type of music. And they showed that those who listened to When I'm 64 became younger, not felt younger, but this experiment turned back the arrow of time and these people became younger. And what the authors show is that you can present that clearly false result in two ways, either in a curated, edited format, which aims to present the cleanest narrative and the most compelling finding, which is shown in bold, or a warts and all more comprehensive and more honest reporting of what you did, which is shown in full. And the point is that the conclusion that you would reach as a reader would be very different if you read only the curated version as opposed to the transparent version. I'll give you a moment to read that. So in this case, the conclusion is clearly false. We can't turn back the arrow of time just by listening to certain types of music. But how many other examples are there out there that are less obviously clearly false? where what we see in the published literature is a curated version of what actually happened and where the full flexibility that was built into the design and conduct and analysis of the study isn't revealed to us. Here's an, one attempt to estimate that, which is a review by Josh Carp of fMRI studies. There were two main findings here. On the right-hand side, he showed that many of the um, methodological procedures that we would need to know about if we wanted to reproduce this study ourselves simply weren't reported in sufficient detail in those papers, making it difficult for um, studies to be independently replicated. But perhaps more importantly, in 240 fMRI studies, there were almost as many unique analysis pipelines as there were studies in the sample. fMRI data, as I'm sure many of you know, is high dimensional, and you need to go through a series of pre-processing steps before you can use it to answer your research question of interest. And what that creates is a very large analytical space that you can explore. And the fact that there are almost as many unique analysis pipelines as there are studies suggests that people are leveraging that analytical space to identify the choices that generate the most compelling or the strongest results, and then only reporting those, which of course is going to systematically bias and inflate our effect size estimates and generate much smaller p-values than are warranted by the actual data taken from an impartial point of view, if you like. So the fact that we can see evidence in the literature of this analytical flexibility, the fact that um, over 90% of studies published in psychology claim to have found what they were looking for all along, should give any of us who've actually done any empirical work reason to pause and think that perhaps not everything is right 
with science as it is at the moment. Because if this really was a true reflection of how science was progressing, then Daryl Bem, the psychologist who studies the ability to see the future, um, quite well-renowned psychologist who's now something of a fringe figure because of that research interest that he's developed, he shouldn't be studying the general population. He should be recruiting academic psychologists because if what we see in the published literature is correct, we must be incredibly good at hypothesizing and foreseeing the future because all of our experiments work. And of course, the collateral damage to that distorted perception that we have from reading the published literature is that early career researchers for whom many of their experiments might not be working start to lose confidence in their own abilities. And we may be losing quite, uh, talented early career researchers because of uh, that mismatch between their own personal experience and what they see in the published literature. And often I hear from early career researchers that as they realize that the um, mismatch is not due to uh, a, a shortcoming in their own abilities, but rather because of what we incentivize in science, they realize that if they're going to have a career in science and to succeed, they need to work in a certain way to ensure their work gets published in journals and published in certain kinds of journals. And they feel uncomfortable with that tension between how they know they should be doing science and how you need to be doing science if you want to have a career. So what are the issues that give rise to this? What are the incentives to change behavior? We ran a review a few years ago which suggested that the average statistical power of uh, studies in a range of different disciplines, we started looking at neuroscience, but we subsequently extended it to other biomedical disciplines. The average power in those studies is too low, whereas conventionally power should be about 80%. We showed that the median power of uh, a range of studies was about 20%, with some evidence of patterning by uh, methodology. But generally speaking, studies are are underpowered and one reason for that is that studies may be too small and if studies are too small they're more likely to give you the wrong answer but if as a researcher you have a finite amount of resources let's say hundred thousand pounds strategically what is the best choice to invest all of that money in a single study that will give you the right answer or will be more likely to be the right answer but where that answer might be unexciting uninteresting and no result that you're going to stop and publish or would the better strategy be to slice those resources into 10 10,000 pound studies to allow you to roll the dice more often? Those individual studies are much less likely to give you the right answer, all other things being equal. But they're much more likely to generate a small p value, a large effect size, some eye catching finding that you'll be able to publish and publish in a certain kind of journal. So one strategy is best for science, and one strategy is best for scientists in their careers under current incentive structures. Can we use something like the prestige of an institution to judge the quality of uh, the work that uh, is generated by that institution? This is a nice uh, study by Malcolm McLeod at the University of Edinburgh, who looked at rodent studies and looked at three measures to protect against bias, randomization, blinding, and sample size calculation. And he looked at whether or not those um, protections were reported in a range of different published studies. Now, the fact that these aren't reported doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't happen, but if they aren't reported, you can't know for certain that they did happen. And he showed, first of all, that these things are generally not well reported. Hardly any studies reported a sample size calculation, very few reported um, blinding, and uh, surprisingly few, given that it's such a basic feature of experimental design, reported uh, randomization procedures. But more interestingly, perhaps, when he looked at the top five institutions in the UK based on the last REF, Research Excellence Framework, in other words, the institutions that are meant to be generating the best quality work that we do in the UK um, in this area, he found that if anything, those studies did worse on reporting these measures of protection against bias than a study drawn at random from PubMed. So on this evidence, our best institutions are doing if anything, slightly worse on these measures of quality than average. And if you were a cynic, you could say, well, one of the reasons for that is that the way to generate a small p-value, a large fair size, an eye-catching finding, is to run a study where you don't randomize, you don't blind, and your sample size is too small. And that might generate a false finding, but if it's a false finding that um, can be published in a certain kind of journal, to an extent that doesn't matter, because if you think about the incentive structures that we have in science at the moment, we're not rewarded for getting the right answer. We're rewarded for publishing, and particularly for publishing in certain kinds of journals, and we're rewarded for getting grants, but we're not directly rewarded for being bright unless you're aspiring to win something like a Nobel Prize, and there aren't many of those. 
And there's other evidence that incentive structures shape behaviour in problematic ways. This is evidence from um, Finelli and Ianita suggesting that studies conducted in the US tend to overestimate effect sizes compared to studies conducted elsewhere in the world. And one reason for that might be that in the US, if you are a full professor with tenure at an Ivy League university like Harvard, fully 0% of your salary might be guaranteed. In other words, unless you get grants, you don't get paid. And so the pressure that that places on individuals implicitly could go a long way towards shaping their behavior, not necessarily in ways that they're consciously aware of, because we know that financial incentives in particular shape human behavior quite strongly. And to take that to an extreme example, these are the direct financial rewards that you receive as an author, as the lead author, on an article that's published in these different journals if you work in China. And you can see that if you publish in Nature or Science, you can receive over $40,000 as a personal reward over and above your salary just for publishing in that kind of journal. And there are other countries that directly financially incentivize um, publication. And to a greater or lesser extent, all academic systems financially reward scientists for publishing because that's the thing that leads to us getting our next job, us getting our next promotion, and us getting our next pay rise. So although this might be an extreme example, it's not qualitatively unique, I would argue. So at this point, the argument is often made, or the counter-argument is often made, that science is self-correcting. Well, that's true in principle, but that only works if science is conducted in the way that it should be. In other words, whilst the scientific method has a self-correction function built into it, if we don't follow the scientific method correctly or precisely, then science may not be self-correcting, or at least not self-correcting as quickly as we would like it to be. So to me, whether or not science is self-correcting as efficiently as it should be is an empirical question. So here are some examples of why we might not think that science is self-correcting as well as it should be. This is a review of 83 articles uh, in the British Journal of Psychiatry, which recommended effective intervention. So these were trials which concluded that this particular intervention should be used for this particular indication because the evidence is that it helps. Half of those haven't been subject to any attempt at replication. So to me, that's a strong conclusion to base on a single study. But of those that have been subject to replication, some did replicate. In some cases, the replication study indicated that the originally reported effect size might be inflated and the true effect might be less. And some studies failed to replicate, as you would expect. What was interesting was that if you look at the sample size of the original study on the y-axis, which of those categories the replication study fell into depended or was patterned by the sample size of the original study. The larger the original study, the more likely it was to replicate, which goes back to my point earlier, that larger studies, all other things being equal, tend to give more precise and more accurate answers, but under current incentives, there may be a pressure, both at the level of funders and at the level of individual researchers, to slice resources thinly to maximize the number of studies that we can run. And we also need to be careful of the, our own uh, biases that we bring to interpreting a literature. This is a nice example of how that can uh, potentially lead us astray, where the same data, data presented in a heterogeneous meta-analysis, were presented to two groups, primary study authors who published in a particular area and methodologists who had no personal investment in that topic, no, no skin in the game. And those who had published in that area were much more likely to conclude from the same data that a strong association existed than were methodologists. In other words, the fact that we have become invested in a particular research field is one of those things that can lead us astray because one of the things that we as scientists, as humans, find it difficult to do is to admit when we're wrong. How often have you been in an argument with someone where at the end of that conversation, the other person has said, I'm so glad you've pointed out to me why I've been wrong all these years. It's just not human nature. It's very difficult to admit when we're wrong. And the same is true of scientists, particularly when the findings that we've published are the thing that we've built our career on the back of. Here's another uh, example of bias, in this case, citation bias. So what you see here are two different literatures, a primary literature shown in white and then an animal cell culture literature shown in blue. And year of publication is on the y-axis. 
The original literature was mixed. Some studies were critical, some were supportive, but the supportive data were enough to give rise to this animal and cell culture literature. And then you can see citations. And what that shows is that nearly all of the citations were to the supportive data. There's one citation to one of the critical studies, but it's shown in white because it's a critical study. So if you were an early career researcher coming into the animal and cell culture literature in the late 1990s, for example, you would have real difficulty identifying the critical studies. You would have the impression, based on what was being cited, that your literature was built on absolutely robust foundations, when in fact the reality was more mixed, because people simply don't cite critical data. And this is why publication bias, which people are more commonly aware of, exists, because if you generate null results, then publishing those null results doesn't generate the same reward for you in terms of citations. And citations are one of those things that we use to measure the quality of individual scientists. So there's much less incentive for us to write up our null results than there is for us to focus our attention elsewhere. And there was an analysis a couple of years ago which suggested that most publication bias is not driven by reviewers and is not driven by journals choosing not to publish null results. It's driven by authors themselves choosing not to write up null results. And we showed something similar here in an analysis of a different literature, the serotonin transporter gene and amygdala activation. And of all of the studies that we identified, about a quarter, 21 or 25 percent, depending on how we define the citation network, were refutation studies, failures to replicate, but they only obtained three to four percent of the citations. Whereas the other studies that either replicated um, a finding or claimed they replicated a finding, which in some cases was a, an overstatement, um, received the remainder of the citations. So people don't cite null results and failures to replicate. And yet, null results and failures to replicate are exactly how science self corrects. Here's another example. These are eight clinical trials of the same intervention against a comparator for the same outcome. In total, over the lifetime of this literature, there were two positive trials that suggested a benefit for the intervention over the comparator, four that were neutral, that suggested no difference, and two that were negative, which suggested that the intervention might cause harm. These were stopped early for safety concerns. And you can see the cumulative citations for each of the individual studies. The first one, which was positive and shown in black, accrued citations very rapidly, and then other trials were published which suggested that um, the intervention may not be as effective as the first published trial had suggested. It's not hard to spot the second positive trial. By that point, there were five studies published in total, one positive, two neutral, and two indicating potential harm, and that didn't slow down the citation of the second positive trial at all. So even when we do publish our null results, it doesn't seem to have much of a correcting impact on science. So there have been a few attempts to model the different parameters of how science is set up at the moment and try to understand how that shapes the behaviour of scientists. The one with the best title, I think, is um, annoyingly not one that I contributed to, which is this Natural Selection of Bad Science, published in Royal Society Open Science which argues that, as I've alluded to, the behaviours that um, promote the careers of scientists are not necessarily the behaviours that promote the best science. And so if you want to survive as a scientist in a competitive ecosystem, you should behave in a certain way. Strategically, it makes sense to do some of the things that we've been talking about. But one of the consequences of that is that the people who come out of those research groups will also be more likely to succeed within the current incentive structures and therefore uh, the practice of bad science will actually have a selection advantage within the system that we've set up and will um, not just be perpetuated over time but will, become, will begin to dominate over time. So the problem is that we do have a scientific method that has given us unparalleled insights into nature and I don't think we should be too nihilistic, we're not making no progress at all. The question is are we making progress as efficiently as we could be? Is science functioning optimally or could we use the scientific method to understand how, scientific, uh, how scientists work and improve the quality of what we do as a result? The argument that uh, 
I and others have made is that the state of science at the moment is a bit like the state of the US automobile industry in the 1970s, where the focus was on productivity, cars would roll off the production line uh, at Detroit, and some guy would count the number of wheels and check the engine started, and that was pretty much it for quality control. And these were badly built cars. They were basically built to be fixed later. And so you had an era where cars were unreliable and a lot of time and effort was being spent fixing them. A statistician, Edward Stemming, went to Japan and introduced the idea of quality control processes at every stage of a production pipeline. So you would build a small part, check that it was well built, put it into a large part, and so on. And as a result, what you produced was high quality. And the Japanese automobile industry still has a reputation for reliability today. The less intuitive insight was that by improving quality of what we produced, you also improve efficiency and productivity because you're not investing resources into fixing cars that are broken down later. So the argument here is that science is like this because many scientific findings are generated with a view to being fixed later. It doesn't matter if they're wrong because someone will come along and somehow science will self-correct. Except that, as we've seen, there's not much evidence of that happening. People don't tend to publish their null results. They don't tend to run replication studies. Even when null results are published, they tend not to cited. So that self-correcting function scientific process doesn't seem to be working as well as it could be. So what can we do about that? And in particular, what can we as individual researchers do about this from the ground up? I've argued that open science has a part to play because that transparency feature of open science, where we make our data or our source or our code or our methods open and available to scrutiny, serves as a quality control process. In our experience, when we make our data open, for example, we know that someone in principle could go through our data and check for errors. The likelihood is that people won't because people are busy and have other things to do, frankly, but the fact that they could means that your average postdoc or senior professor checks their data file four or five times, whereas previously they would have checked it two or three times because the last thing they want is someone spotting an error. So the fact that you're making the data open serves as a quality control process. It introduces an implicit quality control process. Similarly, open methodology, where we now, in my group, routinely publish our study protocols prior to data collection. We do that to uh, allow reviewers to see that what we claim was our intention in our, in our eventual manuscript it was, in fact, what we a priori set out to do, and there have been cases where reviewers have spotted that we said we'd do something differently and it was an oversight on our part, just an honest error, and we've been able to correct that. But we also do it to protect ourselves because often we get to the point where we see the data and it seems blindingly obvious that we should look at sex differences, for example, and that we must have thought of that two years ago when we designed the study. And then we go back to the protocol and it turns out we didn't pre-specify that analysis. It doesn't mean that we can't run the analysis, it just means that we then honestly and transparently report it as a post hoc exploratory unplanned analysis. So it's as much about protecting us from our own biases as it is allowing people, other people to scrutinize our work. So here's an example of how open science practices can change the landscape in terms of published science. In 2000, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in the US required the registration of primary outcomes for all of their grant funded activity. Before then, you could promote a secondary outcome to a primary outcome and claim that it was your primary outcome all along and no one would ever know. Before 2000, which is shown as the little flag here on this uh, figure, most of the trials that were published were positive and indicated a benefit for the intervention over the comparator and some were null, shown in blue. After 2000, nearly all of the trials were null, a couple were positive and showed a benefit, and one for the first time showed harm. I would argue that on the left, you see what science can look like if you're allowed to move the goalposts. On the right, what science really looks like when you have to stick to what you said you would do a priori. And we can incentivize these behaviors. So journals like Psychological Science have begun to introduce badges for studies. Once your study has been accepted, you can request one or more of these badges from left to right for open data, open materials or pre-registration. And looking at open data in this pre-post analysis, following the introduction of those badges, which is shown as the dotted red line, the journal Psychological Science, which is the black line, went from rates of data sharing of about 3% to about 40% over a matter of months, 
whereas a range of comparator journals showed no difference. We can't infer cause and effect from this analysis, but um, it's suggestive that behavior can be changed with quite subtle shifts to the incentives available to us. So we published um, an article where we identify a range of different threats to the quality of the work that we do, and also a range of different measures that key stakeholders like journals, funders, and institutions can enact to improve the quality of what we do. But from a researcher's point of view, the key one, in my opinion, is the use of open practices. This idea that transparency by shining a light on our processes allows greater scrutiny, but more importantly, implicitly introduces quality control measures into our workflow and protects us from our own biases so that the work that we do is of higher quality. And the reality is because we all go into science wanting to do good work, wanting to find out new things, very few of us, if any, go into scientists thinking, if I gain the system, I might become very moderately wealthy in about 20 years. That's not our motivation. But our behavior begins to be shaped by the um, incentive structures that we work with it. An open science approach in my opinion, can protect us against that and ensure that the work we do remains work that we're proud of. So we need to be careful not just to focus on a single solution. There's been a lot of talk about the need for replication and certainly replication is important, but replication on its own isn't going to be a panacea. We need to have a more nuanced approach to this and think about different routes into the same question, different routes into the same problem. And so there won't be a single solution to the problem of quality of the work that we produce, but as researchers, there are some tools available to us that I think can make a big difference. Thank you. So we did have a couple of polls which uh, we'll ask people to complete, which are really intended to capture people's thoughts about um, some of the issues that I've raised and maybe stimulate some questions. And then uh, if you have any questions, you can type them into the question box. So the first poll has launched. If you can vote by just clicking on one or more of these um, answers. These aren't necessarily right or wrong. It's just to capture people's views about different aspects of, in this case, open data and data sharing. So most people said that uh, data sharing acts as a quality control measure. Um, which in a sense was a positive control, because that's, I guess, what I said. So um, I, I hope that means you agree with me rather than just you think that's the correct answer. But uh, I've explained why I think it acts as a positive control measure. And I think generally that resonates with people's own personal experience. Um, that if they know something could be checked, they uh, pay particular attention to it. Enables efficient reuse is the next highest answer. And I think that's true as well. Certainly in my own research where we um, look at causal pathways between behaviours and health outcomes. We've used summary statistics from genome-wide association studies that are publicly available. And that's a very efficient use of uh, data that have been generated through uh, the efforts of others. One of the things we need to think about if we're going to go down that route is how we can attribute the use of data that other people have generated. And in Bristol, we have a very good data repository which assigns a DOI, a digital object identifier, to published data sets, which means that those data sets can be cited and then returned as, a, as the product of grant activity to funders, for example. So we need to think about attribution of data reuse in this new world that we're trying to create, if you like. Protect against publication bias is the next uh, highest answer. And again, I think that's, um, I think that's true um, in that if you're following an open science workflow and you make your data public as a routine part of that, then even if you don't necessarily write up all of your results for publication in the journal, the work that's been done is in principle publicly available. Then we get into two slightly more contentious um, answers. Makes commercialization of research harder? Um, I think that's true uh, in principle, in that by making something public, uh, you have removed um, scope to, for example, patent your work. But the reality is that little of the research that we do probably ends up being commercialized. And there's an argument that um, commercialization is not a profitable enterprise for universities to be engaged in, even though we're encouraged to do it. Most universities over the long run make a loss from their efforts to commercialize their research, even if some of the individual 
um, commercialization efforts are profitable. But that's a, a, a wider conversation, and this does illustrate the fact that, that these things are not necessarily a one-size-fits-all solution. I think um, there can be guiding principles, which for me would suggest that data sharing is a good approach, but there may be exceptions to that. And then finally, allows others to profit from your hard work. And people are genuinely and understandably concerned about this, in my experience. But I think this comes back to the point I made earlier, that if we are going to go down the route of making our data public, first of all, we need to allow the originators to generate the main papers that were planned from that project before all of the data are published. But the other is to um, ensure that there is appropriate recognition of the data that have been generated and attribution um, for the people who did that uh, generation. But it's also worth noting that in most cases, although we often think that we own our research, the reality is that our research is either owned by our employer or by our funder. Um, and is therefore funded in the most cases by public money or by charitable donations. So the idea that we should somehow as individual researchers um, have complete ownership of our data in perpetuity, I think is personally, I think is, is slightly misguided. Let's run the next poll and then we can see if there are any other questions that people have. So you should be able to see that now. And this is about pre-registration of study protocols. So what, if any, do you think are the benefits of pre-registration of study protocols? So this is where you lay out your methodology, the background to your research and the um, research question and also the methods that you'll use to answer that. And then you make that publicly available uh, on a repository on something like the Open Science Framework. And it's placed on that third party platform and then date stamped and time stamped as a record of what your a priori plans were. So I'll start the other way around this time. No one said that it makes exploratory research impossible, which is great from my point of view, because I think this is one of the misconceptions about pre-registration, that it somehow constrains you. It constrains you from pretending that something that you did was what you planned all along, but it doesn't constrain you from running as many exploratory analyses as you want to. It just makes that transparent. Now, this audience is probably a fairly self-selecting bunch, so maybe you don't have that common misconception. But I think it's worth pointing out that if anything, at the moment, exploratory research is, is um, denigrated in, in our incentive structures because we have to pretend that everything is confirmatory. We have to tell a story. And I think the fact that we use that metaphor of telling a story is really revealing because we're scientists, not novelists. We shouldn't be in the business of telling stories. We should be in the business of uh, accurately and dispassionately reporting the results of the work that we did. Pre-registration allows you to say that your analyses were genuinely exploratory and distinguish between exploratory and confirmatory research in a way that I think is made more difficult by the current norm whereby there's no pre-registration of study protocols. So that's good that no one thought that. Increases the risk of being scooped is an interesting one. A lot of people have that concern and again it's understandable. I think the reality is there are very few cases of people genuinely have been scooped. I think it's unusual, although not entirely unheard of. I think that concern partly comes from, again, one of our natural cognitive biases, which is that we think our ideas, um, our research questions are terribly special and interesting and important. And actually, they're probably not quite as exciting as we think they are. We've all had the experience of results not getting published in the journal that we think they should get published in because the rest of the world doesn't see them as quite as exciting as we do. But having said that, if we are concerned about other people uh, picking up on our um, research ideas and working with them themselves, then there are options on platforms like the Open Science Framework to embargo your protocol registration for, I think, one to two years so that it's pre-registered and date stamped and time stamped, but it's not visible until that embargo passes to allow you to continue with your data collection um, with the protection of that embargo. So if that is a concern, and in some cases it might well be valid, then there are protections against that. And then we move on to the popular answers, which um, I certainly would agree with. I think it does protect against publication bias, because we can see, if you like, the denominator, the number of studies that were run, and if the results never emerge, we can infer something about the nature of those results from that. And it reduces peer hacking, this overly aggressive uh, interrogation of our data, just to get a p-value less than 0.05. 
and protects against harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. Um, again, not necessarily because people will go to the bother of cheating, just because having pre-registered your protocol, um, you would have to be pretty brazen to then embark on p-hacking or harking, knowing that someone could actually check and uh, identify that. So it serves as, again, as that kind of quality control process. So those polls were uh, meant to stimulate thoughts about the practicalities of some of this. And we've got a few minutes left if people have any specific questions. So we have one question, which is, I'm struggling to find advice for those of us in developmental psychology who rely on lengthy longitudinal data sets, which have already been collected where it might be difficult to apply open science practices such as pre-registration. Uh, because such data collections are often costly, what could we do? So this is um, at heart a hard question about how we follow these principles when we're dealing with data that already exists. Um, and it's a question that applies to my own research because we do work on this kind of data set. And it highlights, I guess, two approaches to why we might want to do this. If we're talking about pre-registration as a form of policing, essentially, then I think it's difficult in this case because, of course, if the data already exists, there's no way of knowing that pre-registration wasn't posted after someone had already taken a peek at the data. But for me, open science practices aren't about policing. They're about um, quality control processes that we introduce into our own workflows. In other words, I follow open science practices largely for selfish reasons, to protect myself from myself and to ensure the quality of what I do is better. So on that basis, you can develop an analysis plan for your data set, uh, even when the data already exists, but before you've started uh, working through those data perhaps, and pre-register that. And you're doing so to protect yourself against um, the temptation, for example, to go in another direction once you start working on the data. And that's good practice because not only does it protect you against those potential biases, but it also uh, encourages you to think in a great deal more detail than you otherwise might about exactly what your research question is, exactly how you'll use the existing data set that you plan to use to answer that research question, and so on. So I still think you can uh, pre-register your study protocol or your analysis plan when secondary data exists. It's just that um, it won't necessarily then serve the function of a, um, a policing exercise, if you like. So here we have another question, which is what role does systematic review and evidence synthesis have in helping to correct the failure of the scientific method? So I think that's a really good question. I think systematic reviews uh, do help enormously because there are means by which we can identify that hidden literature, if you like. A systematic review is one that identifies studies on the basis of a predefined search strategy, typically looking for particular keywords and so on, and doesn't rely just on citations in articles that we might have read. So if citation bias is operating, which we have evidence it is, uh, then a systematic review is a means of protecting against that. And evidence synthesis, and in particular a quantitative synthesis, like a meta-analysis, can be an important next step. But the problem is, of course, that that assumes that most of what has been done in the scientific in that particular scientific domain has been published. And we know that publication bias exists. We know that some studies don't get published. There are ways of testing for that empirically uh, within a meta-analysis, for example, but those methods are imperfect. There are ways of identifying unpublished or grey literature uh, that systematic reviewers are familiar with, but again, those things are imperfect. So I think systematic reviews and meta-analyses can be excellent and extremely helpful, but they are to an extent um, consistent with that model of trying to fix studies after they've been published. And what I'm emphasizing here is the need to perhaps produce higher quality studies in the first place and a, um, and a set of incentive structures that encourage those, um, those studies to be published and to be in the public domain. And we have one more question, which is can open science guarantee reproducibility? If yes, how can this be verified? And I think part of the problem with that is that there are different words that are used that mean slightly different people, things in slightly different contexts and to slightly different people. So there's reproducibility, which can mean that, for example, people are able to reproduce the analysis that was run on a particular data set, or reproducible, which means that uh, an independent group which runs the same study gets the same results. And people use words like 
reproducible, reliable, replicable, somewhat interchangeably, but they can have slightly different meanings. I don't think that open science is a silver bullet. I don't think it will fix all of the problems around the quality of the research that we produce. And I don't think we should overstate the extent to which there are problems, but I think science can do better than it does at the moment. The reason I focus on open science is because it's one of the things that is, um, to a large extent, entirely within the control of individual researchers. It's something that we can do ourselves from the bottom up. I think there's a lot more that um, institutions and funders and journals need to do, in particular institutions. And one of those things could be, for example, encouraging open science practices in hiring and promotion practices. So in my group, for example, whenever we advertise for a research assistant or postdoc position, we include amongst the desirable characteristics evidence of having uh, followed open science practices in the past. Not because we want to discriminate against people who haven't, that's why we put it as desirable rather than essential, but as a way of incentivizing that kind of behavior in the wider community. And institutions more generally, I think, could, um, could follow suit in that and other ways. So those are all of our questions and we've come pretty much exactly to the end of our time. Apologies for the technical glitches at the beginning, but hopefully um, you heard everything reasonably well towards the end. And uh, you have my contact details on the screen. Do feel free to drop me a line if you have any questions about any of this. And on our lab web page, we have an open materials page, which includes amongst other things, uh, a draft information sheet and consent form for consenting participants in uh, human laboratory research for open data. So if you want to um, if you want to use those, then they're published under a Creative Commons license. Feel free to download them and use them in your own research. Thank you.